Well, we're still in chapter 22. I stopped in the middle, it's a very long chapter, uh, when I saw Juno returning from her walk. <laughs> thought things might not be so quiet. So here's the end of it, and I'll start 23 and see how far we get in a reasonable time. The fire was nearly out. The cauldron had boiled dry, and in the bottom was a whole size of her fist. Rosemary gave a great sigh. She was aware that the thrush was once more tapping with his snail shell. The noise of the fet sounded cheerfully on the breeze again. She stood up with the broom in her hand. Carbonell was still sitting on the far side of the enclosure. See the summoning words, he said harshly. If I am still bound, I must come to you. Rosemary said them rather faintly. She felt strangely tired. By squeak of bat and brown owl's hoot, by hellebore and mandrake root, come swift and silent as the tomb, dark minion of the betwiggy broom. Nothing happened. Carbonell sat still, unmoved upon the bucket. There was a long, long pause, and then, very deliberately, he stepped down and came towards her. Little mistress, he said. You never called me that before. No, I'm no longer your mistress, said Rosemary, her eyes filled with tears. You didn't have to come this time when I summoned you. Carbonell was purring deeply. I came in gratitude. That will be a stronger bond than any spell. And his warm tongue licked her scratched hands. There was a movement on the other side of the enclosure. The young man got up from the wheelbarrow. He yawned and stretched. An extraordinary thing, he said cheerfully. I must have dropped off to sleep, sitting here bolt upright. I had a pretty rum dream, too. I'll tell you about it sometime. Rosemary looked inquiringly at Carbonell. He shook his head. It's just as well you should think he dreamt it. It will save awkward questions. But only Rosemary heard him, because only she had the broom. It has been a warm day, she said. Thank you very much for the hat. We shan't need it any more. No, not at all. I hope you had a good game with it. I say, it's five o'clock. I must fly. Look here, will you and young John put it back in the van? I'll give you the key, and then you can bring it back to the summer house when you've locked up. Here you are. See you later. The children listened in silence to his receding footsteps, and then Rosemary said, I know what I'm going to do. She removed the cauldron and bent down and blew up the fire again, and then she took the book of spells and poked it deep into the smouldering heart of the ashes. Stand back! warned Carbonell, and she jumped away just in time. With a swish, a green flame edged with purple shot up ten feet into the air. For a moment it flashed and flickered, then it wavered and sank. There was nothing to be seen of the book in the bonfire. Nothing but a trickle of sluggish, oily-looking smoke. You are wise, little mistress, said Carbonell. Well, I think it was jolly silly of her, said John. Think what fun we could have had with it on wet days. Nothing but evil ever came of that book. In silence they put away the flower pot in the tool shed. And then taking the broom and the cauldron with them, they went to replace the hat in the van. Before you put the broom in the car, I shall say goodbye, said Carbonell gravely. But shan't we see you again, ever, any more? Must you go? asked Rosemary. I must go. I have work to do. I shall never forget what you and John have done. You will see me at the full moon. He said. He gave Rosemary's hand a little lick, and then he turned, and they watched him grow smaller and smaller as he trotted with head and tail erect down a long path bordered on either side of the tiger lily. And then he turned at a corner and was gone. Now, simply beastly, said John. Everything's over now. We've even missed tea. I'm starving. Silently, he passed Rosemary his handkerchief. We ought to feel as pleased as anything because we've done what we set out to do. But I don't feel so I shall ever be pleased again. And she blew her nose very hard. They left the cauldron and the broom in the car, suitably hidden under the rug. And then they returned to the summer house. But it wasn't possible to feel miserable there for long. To John's relief, there was tea, which they ate sifting on the steps. Mrs Brown and Molly and even Megs and Sarah were still sewing between mouthfuls. The occupier and the other men teased the children in a friendly sort of way. It was all very jolly and cheerful, and by the time they'd started on the second plate of cakes, they felt they knew everyone quite well. The last tunic was nearly done, and Rosemary could see by her mother's smiling face that she was enjoying herself. 
I must admit, she said to her daughter later, that my heart sank when I thought I got to sew this afternoon, just when I was off for a holiday. But it's been such fun, sewing unusual sorts of clothes, and everyone's so friendly, it hasn't seemed like work at all. Your mother is a wonder, said the occupier, and Rosemary flushed with pride. I gather from Molly that not only can she work at twice everybody else's speed, but by some mystic process of hers, called cutting on the cross, she has transformed Oberon's sleeves and saved yards of stuff into the bargain, said Molly. The children and Mrs Brown, as guests of honour, sat in the front row for the next performance. They were acting the fairy part of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and even John, who usually thought of Shakespeare as someone who invented by masters to harass schoolboys, admitted it was smashing. They were transported by the fairy part, and they laughed and laughed at Bottom and his friends. When it was all over, the occupier took them all round the fete again. And John won two coconuts and Rosemary a china kitten in a boot, which she decided to give to Mrs Walker. And when it was time at last to meet Jeffreys in the car, they were both so tired they could hardly keep their eyes open. What a day, said John, as he and Rosemary flopped into the back seat. Did you enjoy it, dears? asked Mrs Brown. We shall never have such a day again, said Rosemary. I wonder what Carbonell meant when he said he'd see it at the, at the full moon, she whispered to John. Don't suppose we shall know till tomorrow, he said. But you get to find out today, because we've now reached chapter 23, which is the full moon. The next day, Rosemary was looking pale. Too much excitement, said Mrs Brown. I wonder if perhaps you'd better stay at home today instead of coming with me to Tussocks. Oh, Mummy, please, begged Rosemary. If you've nearly finished the sewing, I shall hardly have any more time to play with John, and I've got such heaps to talk to him about. Besides, I think I ought to say thank you to Mrs Pendlebury Parker, don't you? Her mother smiled. Well, very well, Poppet, but it must be a really early bed for you tonight. Although Rosemary felt there was so much she wanted to talk over with John, when she reached Tussocks, she found that by common consent they both avoided any reference to Carbonell or Mrs Cantrip or anything magic at all. They played good, solid games like cowboys and Indians all morning, and in the afternoon they built a treehouse, which was fun, until Mrs Pendlebury Parker decided it wasn't safe and made them take it all down again. When Rosemary and her mother reached home in the evening, Mrs Brown said firmly, Now we'll have supper straight away. Scrambled eggs and jam tart, and then you can have your bath and hop into bed. You may take a book with you, if you like. Rosemary had her bath in the usual bower of other people's drying stockings, and then she chose Wind in the Willows, kissed her mother goodnight, and got into bed. But she couldn't breathe. She sat propped against the pillows with the book open before her. But her mind was not on the adventures of Toad and Mole and Rat. It would keep going over the events of the past three weeks. What fun it had all been! What would become of Mrs Cantrip? How would Carbonell win back his place at the head of his kingdom? She closed her eyes to think the better, but she must have fallen asleep, for when she opened them again it was dusk and the book had slipped to the floor. Something dark and furry leapt onto her bed and licked her cheek with a familiar rough tongue. She was wide awake at once. Carbonell, I did so hope you would come. What are you going to do? Is it the law giving tonight? Carbonell was kneading the blanket with his front paws and purring rhythmically. Oh, wait a minute while I fetch the broom. She jumped out of bed and ran to the wardrobe. Now then. It is, as you say, the law giving tonight. Would you like to come? Oh, may I? How lovely. Where is it and how? And what about John? He'd be terribly disappointed if he missed it. Patience, Rosemary. As to where, it will be on the roof of the town hall. Where it has been. Sorry. At every full moon, for four hundred years, and how? By broom. The fact that the moon is full tonight will give it temporary life, and by broom we'll fetch John from Tussocks. But we must make wait for the moon to rise. In the meantime, you had better be composing instructions, and mind they're accurate, he went on in his old manner. You can't afford to make mistakes when you're flying high. Rosemary put on her old red dressing gown and her slippers with the bubbles on them, and then she knelt on the chair by the window with Carbonell on the sill beside her. The sky was darkening, and the vista of roofs stretched dim and shadowy away into the distance. Down below she could see countless moving shapes. Carbonell, look! Running along the top of the wall, hundreds of cats! My people, he said, this is a night they will never forget. As yet they know nothing of my return. 
I thought it best to descend on an unsuspecting enemy. Only Malkin, my father's friend and adviser, has seen me. He is an old, old animal. But I've never seen so many cats. Look at them, all running along the garden wall. There was a steady stream of animals, black, white, grey and tabby, silently but purposefully trotting along the garden wall in the same direction, continually joined by other cats where other walls intersected. This is one of the main roads from the outlying parts, said Corbinell. The sky behind the rooftops was becoming lighter. Look, said Corbinell, the moon! As he spoke, a tiny segment of silver rose from a bank of clouds low on the horizon. Rosemary's hand lay on the cat's sleek back and she felt him stiffen. He was making low, crooning cat noises in his throat. As the moon rose majestically in sight, a superb moon, round as a pumpkin and golden as honey, filling the rooftop world with light and deep mysterious shadow, Carbonell rose to his feet, lifted his head and sniffed the air, and the crooning noise turned to a bubbling wail which rose and fell and rose again to a wild high note which struck the ear like a trumpet call. And then it sank once again to silence. When the moon was sailing high above the cloud rack, he spoke. To broom, Rosemary. And Rosemary bestrode the quivering broom with Carbonell balanced on the sadly diminished twigs behind her. Go on, say it, she, he said. She took a deep breath and said, If you please, my gallant broom, take us straight to John's bedroom. And the broom, which had been giving little hops under her, as though it longed to take the air, rose smoothly and silently, circled once round the room and was away through the window. Rosemary gripped with her knees and screwed up her eyes and her toes. But the motion was smooth and pleasant, and soon she dared to open her eyes and look around her. They were flying high. They skimmed the weathercock of All Saints Church, where she went on Sundays with her mother. They flew over the shopping centre, now empty and silent, with only here and there a lighted square of window over the new housing estate and out over the moonlit country beyond. She was so fascinated by the shifting shapes beneath, she forgot to be frightened. The road wandered idly along like a pale grey ribbon tossed by some careless giant. Away to the south the river gleamed, the silver streak, and woods and houses, barns and ricks crouched like sleeping animals on the crazy paving that was the fields and meadows. Rosemary was so interested in watching it slip away from beneath her, she was quite surprised when Carbonell said, no, 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 no. Duck your head when we go in. She looked up, and there was Tothox apparently rising up to meet them with such speed that Rosemary had a queer feeling in her stomach. How on earth of all these windows could the broom be expected to know which was John's? But it sped on without any hesitation, and just as it seemed they must crash head on into the great castellated wall that rose in front of her, she flung herself flat along the broom and shut her eyes. But it was only by the light touch of a curtain brushing against her cheek that she knew they'd passed into the room. And there she was, actually on John's bed with the broom beneath her. John shot up from the bedclothes, wide awake, with his hair standing up in spikes all over his head. Quick, said Rosemary, mount the broom behind me. We're going to the law-giving to see Carbonell take possession of his kingdom. To John's credit, he didn't stop to ask questions. He tumbled out of bed, and all he said was, Wacko, budge up! Rosemary budged. It was rather a squash, but he bundled up behind her. Make haste, said Carbonell. Now the town hall roof, Rosemary. And Rosemary said, on the town hall roof, put us gently down, and oblige John, Carbonell, and Rosemary Brown. She was rather pleased with this, as being both polite and businesslike. Look! shouted Car Carbonell, and as they ducked, the broom swooshed through the window, and once more they were sailing through the night air back towards the town. I think that's, oh, that's nearly a quarter of an hour. I think that's enough for today. Uh, I'll have to finish this chapter and start the next tomorrow.